So, good morning. My name is Da Ping Chu. I'm the director of CAPE. And welcome to this session of the Kappa Award winner presentation. Kappa Award is sponsored by the CAPE partners to the Cambridge postgraduate student for their own ideas and their own research. And we are fortunate to have many excellent proposals and we select the top winners who have carried out excellent work. And today is the opportunity they present their result. And I'm very pleased to see their capable partners present and uh, like Dr. Marco Hill King, I can see he has a, a symbol with some Chinese traditional food, which we just had that festival. And we also have a Professor John Robertson, Dr. Michael Crisp, and uh, among the others online. Now, without delay, I would like first to introduce the Meng Yuan Tian and the Jia Bing Yang. And they are going to present a wireless power transfer system use high temperature superconducting capacitors. Meng Yuan and Jia Bing. Okay. Um, can I share my screen? Sure. Yes, I can see it now. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jia Bing Yang, a PhD student supervised by Dr. Tim Kunz, working on the application of high temperature superconductivity. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm here to talk to you about our research on a wireless power transfer system using high temperature superconducting capacitors. There are five parts in the presentation. We are going to look at the introduction, methods, results, summary, and future work. There is time for questions at the end of my talk. The wireless power transfer system referred to WPT system has different types. Non-resonant couple inductors such as transformers work on the principle, oh, sorry. Uh, Non-resonant coupled inductors such as Transformers working on the principle of a primary coil generating a magnetic field and a signal coil subtending as much as possible of that field. This can happen only in a short range and often requires a magnetic core. In contrast, the wireless power transfer here needs to transfer energy in a resonant inductive coupling way. Resonance coupling forms a tuned LC circuit Significant power can be transmitted with a primary coil driven at a secondary side rendered frequency. Meanwhile, this type of wireless system's efficiency depends on the quality factor of the inserted rendered circuit to a large extent. Correspondingly, high temperature superconductors, also known as HTS tapes, are promising candidates to overcome this challenge due to the almost zero resistance. Most relevant studies aimed at applying a superconducting coil in the electro system because it can carry significant current density and create a strong magnetic field. But few studies the effect of a superconducting capacitor with a relatively higher dielectric constant in the substrate layer. Therefore, we proposed that two high temperature superconducting tapes holding substrate layers together can also be fabricated to a high quality capacitor with much lower power loss in cooled superconducting same fans and substrate. Now let's move on to the methods. Our research starts from modeling and we presented in February's middle project meeting. We have further revised some of the data and today we are presented with the experiment together. By the finite element method, we simulate the coils and capacitors based on the actual geometry 
and materials. Coils are simulated using 2D axiosymmetric modeling in Thomson Multiphysics. Normal coils are made of copper wire. Superconducting coils are made of superconducting tapes. Inductance and the equivalent series resistance, uh, the so-called ESR, at high frequencies are predicted. Figures illustrate the photographs of coils assembled from copper materials and superconducting tapes and their appearance in the finite element package. Likewise, capacitors are simulated using 3D modeling because the area of the electrode plates affects the capacitance. Control group capacitors are made of copper as electrode plates and ceramic as dielectric. Superconducting capacitors are made of HTS tapes we measure the capacitance and ESR at high frequencies as well. In addition, the Victor Network Analyzer, so-called VNA, is served as a memory tool for inductance and capacitance. Next, the wireless power transfer systems equivalent circuit is developed in MATLAB Simulink, and the modeled inductance, capacitance, and ESR are used as an input of the circuit. The voltage transfer efficiency can be correspondingly calculated. In terms of the system experiment, the setup schematic is shown on the left half. The transfer efficiency is measured using a weak to network analyzer as well. Specifically, the right half shows the combinations of coils and capacitors, normal coils plus normal capacitors, superconducting coils plus normal capacitor and superconducting coil plus superconducting capacitor. Three cases are all tested as a random circuit in the wireless transfer system. It is worth noting that the superconducting materials need to be immersed in the liquid nitrogen bus, and that is why there is a cryogenic container in Big 7. Let's turn to a results discussion. The two tables list the simulated and measured results of coils. We can see their corresponding inductance and ESR basically match. More importantly, the superconducting coil has a much smaller ESR than the normal coil. At the same time, the capacitance and ESR measured in the experiment is consistent with the simulation. And the superconducting capacitor also has a much smaller ESR than the ceramic capacitor. Therefore, under the same inductance and capacitance, both the superconducting coil and the superconducting capacitor have much smaller ESR than the conventional components, meaning there is a higher quality factor in the superconducting millimeter. Then, figure eight plots the simulated voltage transfer waveforms of the system assembled by the mentioned different resonator cases. We calculated the ratio of the amplitude of the input voltage and the load voltage. We can see the superconducting coil in the wind can improve the efficiency from 45% to 55%. And the superconducting coil working with superconducting capacitor further increased this figure up to 70%. That is to say, the addition of superconducting materials can gradually improve the transfer efficiency. And the resonator consisting of a superconducting coil and a superconducting capacitor performs best at the unit frequency. Furthermore, we curved the transfer function expressed as a scattering parameter, namely the S parameter, which describes the input and output relationship between ports in an electrical system. Different combinations of in the nature are tested in simulation and experiment, respectively. Both simulation and experiments show that the Renit inductive company uh, WPD system is most effective at the Renit frequency. And the all superconducting renator exhibits the highest transfer efficiency. Uh, the deviation of simulation and experiment may be due to the insufficient accuracy of the coupling coefficient in models and data collection methods. 
the traps that appeared in the experiment did not appear in the simulation. The reason is that in the simulation, each frequency is simulated separately and discrete points are connected. However, the experiment was to directly sweep the system with a specific frequency range in the Victor network analyzer. To summarize, our research consists of two parts involving simulations and experiments. First, the inductance, capacitance, and ESR of the coils and capacitors at high frequencies are examined with the help of finite element method. Material type, geometry size, and transmission frequency are all considered. Then the wireless power transfer system model has been developed to estimate the transfer performance, the transfer efficiency of different finite materials at frequencies is calculated, showing the significance of superconducting materials. Besides, based on the model parameters, coils and capacitors are fabricated. The simple wireless power transfer system works and once again proves the effectiveness of superconducting components. In general, the mail results agree well with the simulation. Finally, future work continues. The superconducting coils have consumed considerable superconducting takes and show non negligible AC loss at high frequencies. The follow up work is to achieve a more economic coil through an optimized take structure. For example, the thickness of the layered structure of superconducting tapes can be used to adjust the relevant frequency. Also, we have to note that a capacitor has an electric field limit known as a breakdown voltage. So the next focus should be on the dielectric strength of the superconducting capacitor to avoid a short circuit fault in the regulator. As for a system, due to the limited time during COVID-19, we did not implement a real power supply. Therefore, we plan to experimentally install a power supply and load to monitor the actual transfer efficiency and charging speed. Well, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and thank you to all the staff who are working during these challenging times. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Yunbin. Yeah, this is an excellent coverage of what you have done and there is a totally understanding in the COVID situation, the lab access is restricted. But nevertheless, what you showed here is very promising. The talk is now open to questions. Is there any questions? You can unmute your mic to ask. Yes, please, Professor Chu. Thank you, please. Hi, Javin, thanks, good presentation. Um, of course, with any superconducting um, implementation, we're always interested to know how hot can it run? Um, how much do we need to cool it in order to get good efficiencies? Where's the, the sweet spot between the, the expense of um, needing to do the cooling and the benefits from the uh, increased efficiency? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Michael. It's a very good question. Um, what we used is high temperature superconductors. So uh, they should be immersed in liquid nitrogen. So the temperature is just 77 K, uh, it's minus, around minus 20 degrees. Um, um, but for the low temperature superconductors, the temperature will be very, very low and very, very expensive. So that's the advantages of high temperature superconductors. Uh, in terms of the expense, I would say, um, liquid nitrogen is relatively very cheap. I think the price is as equal as, as water in the supermarket. So I think that's fine, yeah. Uh, but the temperature we need to pay much more attention because when the, when the transport current is higher than the critical current, so the current occurs, it may burn out the superconductor. So that's a very critical issue in the application of superconducting materials. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Any other questions? Jiaping, I have a quick question. You okay. showed the improvement of the um, efficiency, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think any further improvement can be made? And does that include using the wiring, use the high TC superconductors in the wiring as well? Because the part that you focus so far is mainly on the capacitor itself. Uh, yes, I, I would say, uh, like what I mentioned in our future work, um, I think we should do more work in the HTS coils because uh, the superconductor mm -hmm. only shows zero resistance in the DC current. So when the current, the frequency of the, of the current is very high, the AC loss is considerable. So we should try our best to minimize the loss in the HTS coils. Uh, so I think this is the first point. Uh, uh, but by the way, actually, um, the structure of HTS coil is customized. So like we can reduce the use of copper and silver in the superconductors to reduce the AD current loss, uh, et cetera. Uh, another point in terms of our work, I think we should increase like the materials, uh, I would say magnetic core, what kind of thing in the system to increase the to increase the efficiency, uh, because we just want to compare the difference uh, with or without the addition of splinter materials. So we didn't use any magnetic core or kind of thing. Uh, I think uh, later we should consider this point. So Thank you were talking about the flux pumping technique. Uh, yes, we will see. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, another question is how high the current density you can achieve nowadays. I think that will limit how much power you can transfer. Uh, yes, um, actually, um, first in our experiment, we didn't imply a real power supply uh, due to time, but we will do it later. Um, but the question depends on the performance of spin factors. What we use, uh, the critical current is just around 200 amperes. So, but it depends uh, if we need to increase the power, of course, we need to use a kind of new superconductors. So I think, uh, um, yes, we need to keep the current um, much lower than the critical current for the safety issues. Yeah, I was wondering because the people are aiming for kilowatts or higher. And uh, of course, the current is a limit, but it may be uh, you can increase the voltage or whatever the things, yeah, try to yes. keep the power high. Yes, it is, yeah. And we can increase the, the number of coils, maybe, yeah, because we just use a single pancake coil. Maybe I use double or something, yeah, we'll see. Do you think that the approach you are doing is scalable to the high power? Mm -hmm. I expect that, but uh, I need to do the experiment to, to see how it gets around. Sure, sure. At least uh, there is no fundamental barriers for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any thank you. questions? Okay, if there's no further questions, let's thank Javin for the excellent talk. Yeah, then we'll move to the next one. Javin, you can leave the screen now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. The next talk is uh, will be given by Liam Bird and Dylan Maxwell. And their project is on three electrode electrochemical cell with integrated pressure sensor. Liam and Dylan. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just share my screen now. Okay, Dylan. Thank you. Okay, how does that look? Yeah, it comes through. Just put it full screen. And then we'll go. There we go. Yeah, 
that are uh, here to talk about our, our project on um, designing and, and fabricating and, and testing a three electrode chem electro three electrode chemical cell uh, with an integrated pressure sensor. Um, so a little bit of introduction. Uh, so an electrochemical cell is kind of the the main uh, characterization tool or technique that we use to to characterize uh, lithium uh, ion or other battery systems, uh, lithium sulfur included. Um, and so typically that consists of a, a two electrode cell, um, usually in a coin cell format, um, so where we have an anode and a cathode, uh, and then by applying uh, either fixed current or, or stepping through voltages and, and measuring uh, the applied changes in, in voltage or current, um, we can track changes uh, in the uh, electrochemical sort of track electrochemical processes going on within the battery. Um, so during charging and discharging, you have these lithium ions that tra travel back and forth and, and shuttle between the, the anode and the cathode. Um, and so by, yeah, by measuring the, the, the voltage, changes in voltage, we can look at the um, physical processes going on and try and get an understanding of, of the different reactions um, going on within the, system, within the batteries. Uh, and another tool we've got, um, so in a, in a full cell, when we're trying to, to measure um, the potential difference between these, these two electrodes, um, because in a full cell, the, both materials will have a changing um, a voltage. The, it's, it's difficult in a two electrode cell to kind of isolate which electrode is, is causing sort of, um, when you cycle these materials, which, which one is causing the failure of the, of the battery. So what we can introduce is a, a third electrode, a reference electrode here, um, typically made of, of lithium metal, which is which we don't pass any current through. So then we can measure the potential difference between both electrodes separately. So between the reference electrode and the, the cathode and the reference electrode and, and the anode. And through that, we can track changes independently of, with both electrodes uh, and gain understand, deeper understanding as to which electrode is causing uh, issues within the battery. and, and, and um, because it's, this is important to test full cells. So typically we, we test a lot of materials just in half cells. So we we'll measure one electrode versus um, a lithium metal electrode, um, but it's important to test full cells as well because uh, the, the degradation mechanisms in full cells can be quite different to half cells. Um, so within our project, um, we basically aim to, to take this three electrode cell and integrate a pressure sensor with, with it. Um, and to, to our knowledge, um, to our best best knowledge, at the moment that in the literature we have not we've not found any sort of examples of a of a pressure sensor being integrated into a three electrode cell. Um, and so this integrating a, the the pressure sensor allows us two sort of main benefits. So the first being uh, when we assemble the the cell. Um, the, the stack pressure, so the pressure applied between the, the anode and the cathode is quite important um, because if it's, it's too low, then we introduce uh, extra ohmic resistance and if it's too high, then we sort of reduce the battery performance. So it's really key to get kind of an optimum pressure between the two electrodes. And, and this is, um, we think, dependent on, on the battery chemistry used as well. So it's, it's a good idea to be able to test this um, for different battery chemistries. And the other main benefit um, I'll show to you with the, with couple examples um, is, is we'd like to try and do some in situ monitoring. So basically monitoring the changes in pressure as we test the battery, as we cycle the battery. Um, and so this is really interesting, particularly in terms of um, silicon anodes. So this is one of the materials I'm working on in my PhD. Um, and so these are interesting materials because they can store 10 times more uh, lithium, 10 times more energy than um, conventional lithium ion batteries. Um, and they do this through a, a series, well, you can yeah store a lot more um, a lot more lithium and and the reaction occurs you start by with crystalline silicon um, and as you lithiate silicon you, you go through these amorphous phases eventually getting to this crystalline uh, li15 si4 phase uh, where the material of silicon is expanded by around 300 um, percent and the other interesting thing is we get at, at low voltages you get this um, electrolyte breakdown layers, the solid electrolyte interface, which is the electrolyte that breaks down and, and forms this passivating layer on the surface of the silicon. And then in subsequent cycles, um, as you as you relithiate the silicon again, so you, it contracts when you delithiate, and then it 
expands again as you as you real estate it. and this SCI layer the solid electrolyte interface layer is um, quite fragile and it fractures and, and breaks when you re-expand the, the silicon and and when you expose silicon fresh silicon surfaces you get more SCI forming on the surface and over multiple cycles you get this expansion and contraction of the, of the silicon and sort of continuous SCI formation and, and this is ev eventually what leads to the um, uh, death of the battery and increases the impedance and everything um, and so we have many sort of uh, strategies to try and mitigate this this pulverization and, and try and improve and extend the the cycle life of, of silicon anodes and um, but really we think incre including a, a pressure sensor would be really interesting to try and monitor the, these changes in in, in pressure and, and try and correlate these to to the volume expansion and try and gain further insight into into battery failure mechanisms. Uh, I'll hand over to Liam for. Um, yeah, so a second example that we've looked at is in lithium sulfur batteries, which are, um, again, different from conventional lithium ion batteries that are currently used commercially. Um, they use a sulfur cathode um, inside a conductive matrix, which is usually made of carbon um, or a, uh, some kind of um, porous uh, conductive material, and they're able to store about five times more energy per unit weight than a conventional lithium ion battery cathode made from um, a metal oxide such as cobalt oxide. And these store energy through the um, conversion of elemental sulfur, which is sulfur eight to lithium sulfide um, through a series of uh, stepwise reactions, which are indicated uh, within the electrochemistry, which you can see on the left here um, as a, a series of different voltage peaks. Um, during the conversion of elemental sulfur to lithium sulfide, there's a large decrease in density. Um, so there's a, the lithium sulfide occupies 80% more space than the elemental sulfur, which leads to an increase in the volume. Um, and this impacts on the conductive host matrix because it applies a, a load which can lead to fracturing and loss of electrical connections. Um, another load that uh, can affect the electrical connect connections is due to the redeposition of these polysulfides, which are soluble in the electrolyte and which shuttle between the two electrodes as they dissolve. Um, so something else, uh, so similarly, the, similar to the uh, silicon electrodes, the lithium sulfur cells are also affected by the applied stack pressure, um, which is illustrated in this electrochemical image on the left. Um, so the light green color corresponds to a low applied pressure. And then the darker blue color, which is the, um, the highest current and is shown here, um, is for a higher applied pressure. Um, and this corresponds to improved electrical connections. So clearly controlling the pressure applied for cells that are otherwise exactly the same in terms of the electrode composition um, has quite a big impact on the cell performance. Um, Okay, so uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, so looking at the um, the design of the three electrode cell, um, it's a kind of cylindrical uh, external holder made from peak, uh, which is a electrochemically inert and um, also chemically inert to the different electrolytes that we're using, um, and this contains the two. Um, electrode contact, which are made from stainless steel, which is again, electrochemically inert and doesn't participate in the electrochemical reaction at all. We can then apply pressure through the two caps, which are shown at the top and the bottom. Um, and, um, and then at the bottom of this image, you can see the sensor with the black uh, cable coming out of it, um, which doesn't have to be installed when we're assembling the cell inside the glove box. So we don't have to put it through the vacuum chamber during assembly. Um, looking at the 3D view on the right, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the electrode configuration on the next slide. Um, but this is looking down what is the top of the cylinder on the left of the slide. Um, and these are the three different electro contact points. Um, so uh, I guess clicking again, um, we can see that the sensor is then inserted at the bottom. So one of the two 
uh, kind of T-shaped cylindrical contacts um, then has a small cylinder that protrudes through the bottom and presses onto a kind of button on the top of the sensor, um, which then measures the applied load. Okay, um, so looking at the two different uh, configurations of electrodes that we tried, as Dylan mentioned earlier in the presentation, normally when we test electrode, uh, test electrochemical cells in a kind of coin cell configuration, um, we only have the cathode and anode contacts at the top and bottom of the coin cell. So um, we experimented with a couple of different configurations to see uh, which is the best position for the third electrode. Um, and in both instances, um, contact was made um, through a copper wire, which was inserted through one of the kind of cylindrical things, which you can see protruding out of the side of the main cylinder. So, um, Looking at the two different configurations that we're referring to, there's the kind of T configuration where the reference electrode sticks out the side, um, kind of like the base of a T um, with a piece of lithium twisted into the copper wire, which has two separate cables. And this is the one that you can see in the top right of the uh, photos with a piece of lithium um, highlighted in red. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so this is kind of within the, uh, in line with the, uh, uh, sorry, um, kind of perpendicular to the um, direction of the main electrode stack. The other configuration that we looked at um, is the external reference electrode, where it's, the reference electrode is kind of external. So the main electrode stack and the contact is made through the center um, contact point using a copper wire beneath the copper current collector on the anode. Um, this has the advantage that there's kind of inherent control over the distance between the reference electrode and the rest of the stack. Um, it does have a disadvantage in that we need slightly more electrolyte um, to make sure that there's electrolyte contact between the reference electrode and the rest of the cell. Um, and this can mask some of the degradation mechanisms that we want to look at um, when there's excess electrolyte. Um, yeah, so the photos on this slide show uh, what it was like to assemble the cell ergonomically inside the glove box where there's quite limited dexterity. Um, but it was, in terms of the, the difficulty, it was very similar to assembling a standard coin cell. Um, yeah, and then in the bottom right, you can just see the first cell that was assembled um, and it had a non-zero open circuit potential, which indicated that it was working okay. Thanks. Um, so in terms of monitoring the pressure sensor and synchronizing the data with the electrochemical data, um, we have this load cell, which is integrated in the bottom of the cell uh, and connected to a Raspberry Pi through a load cell amplifier circuit. Um, and later on, um, you'll see that there's some noise in the data. And I expect that some of the noise comes from just the electrical connections uh, within this amplifier circuit, which is hand soldered and then just connected to the Raspberry Pi. Um, so we wrote a graphical user interface for some control of the electrochemical, uh, of the sensor um, and recording of the data um, with a timestamp so that it can be matched up to the electrochemical data easily. Um, in terms of calibrating the pressure sensor via the load cell amplifier, um, we had a series of different weights. So uh, zero grams, 50 grams, 100 grams and 200 grams and looked at the linear increase in the output voltage compared to the, um, the load that was being applied and used this to effectively calibrate the load sensor. And then before each experiment, uh, we take an average of the um, output of the load sensor and use that as a baseline. Okay, um, so as a starting point, we looked at a two electrode lithium sulfur cell, which is uh, well characterized electrochemically in terms of this composition of electrode. Um, so in the top right, that's, uh, sorry, top left, there's uh, the electrochemical profile of the cell, um, which is then, uh, if you can imagine that kind of being unraveled, um, this is kind of represented by the blue current line in the larger graph below it. So um, during the first 24 hours, which is 
represented by the part where there's a high voltage that's kind of constant. Um, this is where the cell was left so that the electrolyte could kind of percolate through the separator and through the electrode as well. Um, and that's kind of a steady increase in pressure throughout this time, which is probably associated with um, like the absorption and the swelling of the electrode by the uh, at the electrolyte by the electrode, and especially the polymer binder. Um, beyond this point where the, the voltage was then varied, there's a kind of steady increase in the pressure with time, um, and also some more localized increases and decreases in pressure as the current changes. Um, and uh, looking at the, the scatter plot in the top right, uh, this is for the first discharge and charge cycle. Um, and during the first discharge, the pressure change with changing current is positive. Um, and this is uh, theoretically associated with the formation of this lithium sulfide, which has a higher volume than the, um, the precursor, which is the elemental sulfur. Um, and then during the first charge, the pressure then remains positive initially and then decreases. Um, however, this kind of linear steady increase in pressure with cycling um, and the um, non-ideal electrochemical performance of the cell that you can see um, initially because of the spiky voltage profile. Uh, normally, I would associate this with forming lithium dendrites. So in a lithium sulfur cell, the anode is always elemental uh, lithium or lithium metal, um, which is different from a, a lithium ion battery where the anode is lithiated graphite. So it's quite easy for dendrites to form. Um, and also this uh, voltage profile is similar to the cells I tested previously where a low pressure was applied, which is also conducive to lithium dendrite formation. So it was tempting at first to attribute the failure of the cell and the poor performance to the formation of lithium dendrites. Um, but the increase in pressure that we saw from the pressure sensor forced me to think about it slightly differently. Um, and I think it's quite likely that actually the decrease in uh, cell current with time and the uh, corresponding increase in pressure was actually due to the deposition of um, lithium polysulfides at the interface of the um, cathode and the electrolyte, um, leading to an increase in cell resistance with time and a decrease in uh, active material utilization, which would also cause um, an increase in the viscosity of the electrolyte and uh, correspondingly more uh, resistance in the cell and capacity degradation. So it was in interesting to see um, a different perspective on what could be causing the cell failure that I maybe wouldn't have considered normally um, that came from looking at the pressure data. Okay, thanks. So moving on, um, we tested three different uh, electrochemical, um, three electrode cells. Um, so both what in, in the two different configurations that Liam's already uh, discussed. So the first one we tested was in this uh, T cell um, configuration with the, the reference electrode on the on the side um, on the side of sort of the the, the inner um, cavity of the of the electrochemical cell. Um, and so we applied, we did a similar test where we um, allowed the, the cell to rest and al allow the electrolyte to, to percolate through the, the um, so in this case, we used a silicon graphene anode and, a, and an NMC, a nickel manganese cobalt oxide cathode material. Um, and so we allowed the, the electrolyte to, to percolate through. Um, and then on, on application of a, of a current after uh, 12 hours, um, we had a short circuit, so um, upon opening the, the cell, it looks like the, the um, reference electrode had contacted the, the NMC cathode material and, and short circuited. Um, but even so, even looking at the, um, the pressure data, um, we can see so the initial sort of um, decrease away from the baseline, um, I think, is just through sort of connecting the cell as a, a small um, change um, possibly this is just yeah, we need to optimize how we how we're looking or, or improve the way we're taking our baseline value um, but after this um, there's a slow increase over around sort of 10 10,000 seconds 
um, which we believe is because of the, the again, the electrode swelling, the binder swelling, um, um, but also could be due to um, this SEI formation that even though we're not cycling the battery that um, I've seen examples of this um, within some other work that I've done, it's just the, the, there's a, kind of a native SEI, we call it, that um, even before cycling can, can form um, on the surface of the silicon anode. Um, so it's really interesting that we can, we can see that um, even though the battery failed. Um, so then we tried again um, if a different configuration. So this time with the sort of the reference electrode at the bottom um, and the sort of external um, underneath the, the, the full cell. Um, and this time the um, open circuit voltages for, for the NMC in, in blue and the silicon in, in orange here um, were a bit more steady, uh, but then and when we applied the current after again after 12 hours we had a short circuit um, and we can see that the um, the voltage was fell below zero so this is indicating that there is a lot of current being applied um, and so as we opened up the cell we saw that um, the lithium metal um, electrode here so this the shiny one had been stripped um, so when we compare that to how a normal uh, lithium metal electrode looks like within in battery it has a sort of much more a, a dull color um, so this shiny color is indicating that it, it did strip and expose fresh surface uh, and deposited um, on the back of the of the lithium of the copper current collector that's um, on, of the anode um, so this is a, two, two interesting things from this is that we can see um, that our cell is definitely airtight um, and that the lithium metal didn't didn't react um, so lithium oxide if it did react with, with the air so it's um it's kind of a dull color as well a white whitish dull color um and we can see that the uh, again we had this sort of change in, in pressure so an in initial increase which is correlated with this increase in in the open circuit voltage of the silicon anode um which is as again as the electrolyte percolates through this composite um, nano electrode nano nano composite electrode um it you would as the electrolyte percolates the the open circuit voltage should increase um as the ohmic sort of, uh, resistance decreases uh, and then again we had this slow buildup of, of pressure as this uh, native sei forms in the, in the binder swelling but then after that the the pressure remains very stable other than the the noise from the from the amplifier um so that shows that we're not having any um electrolyte evaporation uh, which is a common problem with these uh, different um, peak uh, cells that I've worked with for different um, different characterization uh, different testing um, yeah and so then again on the third uh, test we again went back to this T cell configuration um, and again unfortunately had a had a short circuit um, so this time it was a slow kind of short circuit so the the um, measuring the looking at the um current the counter electrode the nmc um cathode we saw that there was a slow uh, short circuit and, and upon opening the cell um the nmc cathode had delaminated from its aluminium current collector so um and we believe that was because of the short circuit uh, but again we still saw this slight increase in the in the pressure as the um binder swelled and this native SEI formed. Um, so these are, yeah, really interesting things that we didn't even expect to be able to see um, and, and allow us to sort of have deeper understanding of um, why these um, cells may have failed. So, um, but in conclusion, uh, we were able to design uh, and test a novel electrochemical cell, uh, which was easy to assemble within the glove box um, and provided an airtight uh, environment um, to test and um, perform electrochemical tests on two and three electrode cells. Uh, unfortunately, in the three electrode cells, um, we still need to, to work on trying to optimize the positioning of the, the reference electrode, but in the two electrode format, um, we were able to get some, some nice data um, that, and, and the pressure sensor was sort of well matched in terms of sensitivity. Um, and we were able to get some, some good insight into the, the battery in terms of um, native SEI formation, binder swelling and, and dendrite formation. And, and um, yeah, it seems like at least in the two electric, two electrode format, uh, just as a few, a few tests to try and optimize the stack pressure 
um, could could allow us to have some nice nice testing of um, long over long term to, to um, try and look at the the changes in pressure in, in a two electrode cell. Uh, in terms of future work, like I said, yeah, we want to try and optimize this this two electrode um, and three electrode configurations with the in terms of the reference electrode, um, and we'd also like to try and optimize the the stack pressure. Um, and in terms of deeper analysis of the battery, so right now we're just looking at uh, the changes in pressure, but it, I think it'd be really nice to try and, and, and model the elastic modulus of the different components to try and understand the changes in stress and strain um, and correlate that back to the uh, electrochemical data to, to provide deeper insights into to the failure mechanisms. So yeah, that, that's, that's our project. So thanks for listening and, and any, any questions are welcome. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk. I think the marine in situ uh, in an electrochemical cell is uh, very important. And the application to the battery failure mechanism is a nice one. And uh, I particularly encourage you to see you have uh, covered the whole range from the device and uh, then the cell module in situ measurement and uh, even now getting close to identify the relations and the, between the in situ pressure and the, the cycling. And the, I think that is a, a very nice work. Now, in the interest of time, we'll only have one short questions. Anybody, one short question. No? In that case, let's send the uh, Liam and Dylan again. I'm sure if there's anything, you can contact them via email or the CAPE office can help. Thank you very much. Liam. Thank you. We're a little bit behind the time. So without delay, let's welcome Mala Chelasiva Lingen. And uh, the talk is on mastery of microchip technology to tackle air pollution. Mala. Uh, yeah. Uh, so good morning, all. Uh, I'm Malar Chela Sivalingam, a PhD student in the engineering department. And my supervisor is uh, Professor Ashwin Seshia. So if we're, you were there for the Cape February event, you will know already what this presentation is going to be about. Today, I'm going to talk about the continuation of my previous presentation, which is the mastery of microchip technology to tackle air pollution part one. And this is uh, part two. So let me give a quick recap of uh, my previous presentation. So this project is about using MEM sensors to sense ultrafine particles that are less than 100 nanometers in diameter. So why do we need to sense these ultrafine particles? Because ultrafine particles are accountable for affecting human health by causing respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. There are also other MEM sensors that exist for sensing the ultrafine particles. And these sensors function on different actuation and transduction principles. Uh, regardless of the actuation and transduction mechanism in these sensors, these sensors are based on uh, the resonant frequency shift. So depending on the mass of the nanoparticles that uh, get onto the surface of these sensors, their resonant frequency change. By noting the frequency change, we will get to know the actual mass of the nanoparticles. So in this one, we should note that the resonant frequency changes not only because of the mass, but also because of temperature. So to account for canceling the resonant frequency shift due to temperature, my previous work was about designing a type of MEM sensor that provides higher sensitivity to ultrafine particles. At the same time, uh, it also cancels the effects due to temperature. My previous experiments used a MEMS resonator, which I designed based on the principle of vibration mode localization. You can see a MEMS chip at the top, fabricated based on piezo MEMS uh, process. Previous design of coupled MEMS resonators worked on the principle that if uh, two resonators are identical, then energy will be equally distributed between the two. If we try to create or uh, alter the identical condition of the resonator by introducing mass in one of the resonators, then this vibration energy will be confined to one of the resonators instead of getting equally divided between the two. So this is called the vibration energy confinement and to monitor this vibration energy confinement, we need to consider the ratio of amplitude of vibration 
between the two resonators instead of considering the resonant frequency shift. So this means that uh, by adding mass on one of the resonators, we can monitor the amplitude ratio as the output signal, which will indicate the quantity of mass added. The other advantage with these resonators is that since we are taking amplitude outputs from both the resonator, if one resonator gets affected by temperature, the other resonator signal will also get affected by temperature to the same extent. So when we take uh, the ratio of amplitudes as the output, this temperature effect can be cancelled. In these type of coupled MEMS resonators, usually there will be uh, two resonant modes because there are two resonators involved. So one resonant mode will indicate the out of phase displacement of the two resonators and the other mode will indicate the in phase uh, movement of the two resonators. So you can see it in this simulation, for example. Uh, so here, uh, this is the first resonator and the next resonator is shown uh, adjacent to it. So this is also a square shaped resonator. So for the first resonator, if two sides tend to contract, the other two sides tend to extend. For the second resonator, this will be the exact opposite to that of the first resonator. That's why we call this as out of phase displacement of this coupled MEMS resonator. So the main condition to be satisfied for vibration energy confinement to occur in this coupled MEMS resonator is that the coupling between the two resonators should be weak. So we can design the coupling according to that criteria. Now the experiment. So with this uh, previous design of MEMS resonators, diesel suit particles were generated in the lab environment and were deposited onto the two resonators for about 40 minutes. 40 minutes on the first resonator and 40 minutes on the second resonator. So this is to verify the sensitivity as well as the mass balancing capability. Sensitivity was higher when considering amplitude ratio as output instead of considering the resonant frequency shift as output. Similarly, the resonators returned to their initial state when particles were deposited onto both the resonators. So the resonators were also insensitive to temperature when amplitude ratio was considered as the output signal. So in the previous design of coupled MEMS resonators, we have seen improvement to uh, mass sensitivity based on amplitude ratio as output, common mode rejection to temperature, and mass balancing technique for extending sensor lifetime. So what is the objective of this project? The objective is to see how far one could go down in size by utilizing the mass balancing techniques without compromising the other metrics of the resonator, such as high sensitivity, high stability, and common mode rejection to temperature. Taking all this into account, a new design was made for the coupled MEMS resonator. Now, if you recall uh, what I explained about the previous design, you will realize that there will be two resonant peaks because of two resonators. And these two resonant peaks correspond to the movement of the resonators at out of phase and in phase. If the resonators are identical, these two uh, resonant peaks will be in symmetrical condition. So at the symmetrical condition, the two resonant peaks uh, in a single resonator will come close to each other, but will not intersect with each other. When we add mass onto one of the resonators, so the condition becomes asymmetrical, which means the two resonant peaks in one of the coupled MEMS resonator starts to move apart from the other one. So there will be a distance which will be created between the two resonant peaks when mass is added onto one of the coupled MEMS resonators. So the other graph shows the amplitude ratio simulation. So this is for one of the resonant peaks. At the first resonant peak, uh, for example, we can consider either the first resonant peak or the second resonant peak among the two resonant peaks. So if we consider one resonant peak, we are considering the amplitude of displacement of both the resonators and taking their ratio as the output. So this graph shows that for one of the resonant peaks, the amplitude ratio increases if the mass addition on resonator increases. So depending on the requirement, uh, we can consider any of the two resonant peaks. And for the new design, uh, the resonant peaks at around 5.5 megahertz are considered. So as I mentioned, there will be two resonant peaks and one peak is shown here. Since there are two resonators, you will get the same type of resonant peaks from the two resonators. Now we are considering the amplitude ratio as the output in these two resonant peaks. After determining the resonant peaks in the new coupled MEMS resonators and obtaining their amplitude ratio, uh, the stability test was performed for this uh, new design of coupled MEMS resonator. 
So this graph here shows uh, the stability output for the coupled MEMS resonator based on Allen deviation. So this stability output is to see how the amplitude ratio output signal and frequency output signal deviates over time. By looking at these graphs, we can say that the frequency stability deteriorates over time, but the amplitude ratio stability deviates only at very small levels over time. So if we combine these two graphs together, it will become clear that the amplitude ratio output signal is suitable for long-term measurements than the resonant frequency shift output signal. And after determining the stability output in the new design of coupled MEMS resonator, the resonator's response to temperature was tested. So here, what we are seeing is the temperature was increased by one Kelvin and the frequency response uh, for one of the resonator was recorded by varying the temperature. You can see that the frequency tends to decrease with increase in temperature. But if we look at the amplitude ratio graph, the amplitude ratio stays constant uh, more or less for the same degree of increase in temperature. So this again confirms the common mode rejection to temperature in the new design of coupled MEMS resonators. Now, in order to verify the mass balancing capability, the resonators were subjected to eight minutes of polystyrene uh, latex nanoparticle deposition. So since these polystyrene latex nanoparticles are size calibrated, and since these new resonators, uh, these are newly designed resonators, so initially the experiment started with polystyrene latex nanoparticles. Uh, so eight minutes of deposition on the first resonator, and 15 minutes of deposition on the second resonator was carried out. At the end of 15 minute of particle deposition on the second resonator, the amplitude ratio output returned to its initial state. So initially it was close to one and then it deviated and then it uh, came back to the initial state. So, so far so good. So we have seen uh, the stability output, the common mode rejection to temperature and the mass balancing capability of the new design of coupled MEMS resonator. And now, the sensitivity. The sensitivity of this new design of coupled MEMS resonators uh, were plotted with respect to the polystyrene latex nanoparticles. The amplitude, ratio uh, the amplitude ratio sensitivity was higher compared to the resonant frequency shift based sensitivity in the same device. Then the mass that got onto the surface of the resonators were calculated by combining the stability and the scale factor graphs. Here we should note that the mass resolution was higher compared to the previous design of the coupled MEMS resonators. Initial results from this experiment show that the mass resolution using this new design of coupled MEMS resonator has come close to the mass of a single virus. Uh, you can refer elsewhere about the mass of a single virus. Since this experiment confirmed higher mass resolution with the new design of coupled MEMS resonator, another experiment was attempted. Uh, so it is the indoor particle deposition experiment. So this time, instead of generating particles in the laboratory, indoor particles were impacted onto the surface of the coupled MEMS resonators without any size selection. So these indoor particles are the one which you can see in your uh, rooms or offices or even in houses. So in this experiment, we wanted to see the response of the coupled MEMS resonators when indoor particles were collected onto the surface of the MEMS resonators in days and weeks. This is also to see what the lifetime of the new sensors would be. So with the first set of experiment, uh, there is only small variations in the output signal when indoor particles were collected for about 1.5 hours or two hours. So then uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions, running continuous experiments or collecting indoor particles continuously and monitoring the output signal uh, for days and weeks have become cumbersome. So this is an ongoing work. Uh, the future work will focus on identifying the limitations or challenges associated with the MEMS resonators when obtaining particle measurements in days. Also, these particles are not size selected. So the other direction is to see the response of the couple MEMS resonators without size, select, uh, uh, size selecting the indoor particles and impacting them directly onto the surface of the coupled MEMS resonator. Thank you for listening. Uh, so this is all about my research work in the second phase of this project. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Mala. This is a, a very exciting talk. And uh, it's uh, very nice to see you have uh, put the MEMS uh, simulation and the practice all together and showed a, a very
very good result quickly in the amplitude determine rather than the conventional phase shift. So the talk is open to questions. Any questions? Hello. Yeah, hello. hello. Yeah, Mala, can you go back to the graphs slide? Uh, which one is it? Uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, these. Could you please again explain what you are you saying? Uh, with this graph? Yeah, this one and the next slide. Oh, this one and this one? Yeah, right. Okay, uh, so there are two uh, resonators over here. Hmm. I'll go to this picture maybe. Yeah, this one. So there are two resonators over here. Uh, so most of the resonators um, that are used for this ultrafine particle detection are a uh, single resonator or the standalone resonator. So in that case, you'll observe the resonant frequency shift based on the mass of particle that is added onto the surface of one of the resonator or a single resonator. So in this case, it's a coupled resonator. So there are two resonators. Uh, so okay. even if there are two resonators, we can consider both resonant frequency shift as the output and amplitude ratio uh, shift as the output. So when mm -hmm. I say amplitude ratio, what I'm meaning is, uh, so we will observe what is the amplitude of displacement from one resonator and what is the amplitude of displacement from the other resonator. And then we'll calculate what is the ratio of the amplitudes. Right, At right. the same time, we will also uh, see what is the resonant frequency shift. So in this graph, uh, you can see so when we measure uh, from the first resonator among the two coupled resonator, if we measure from the first resonator, the red graph shows there is one resonant peak. And then when we take measurement from the second resonator, uh, the blue one shows there is another resonant peak. Uh, so yes. these two resonant peaks will have uh, different amplitudes. So when uh, uh, they are symmetrical in condition, the amplitudes should be equal because we are not creating any disturbances in these two resonators. So if we take amplitude ratio uh, by considering the amplitude of first resonator and the amplitude of second resonator, that will come close to one uh, without any um, perturbation in these coupled resonators. So what I'm doing in uh, this experiment over here is observing the resonant frequency from one of the resonator. So with uh, changing the temperature. So when I observe the resonant frequency, uh, uh, resonant frequency, uh, I was observing the resonant frequency in one of the resonator by changing the temperature by one Kelvin. So the resonant frequency was decreasing uh, with uh, increase in temperature. But when I considered the amplitude ratio as output, uh, so this was close to 0 0.96. As I mentioned over here, there was uh, the uh, two resonant peaks from the two resonators. And when we consider the amplitude ratio, normally it should be close to one. So with the change in temperature, what this amplitude ratio graph shows is that even when we tend to increase the temperature, if we consider amplitude ratio as the output signal, uh, the, it stays more or less uh, constant for a longer time duration instead of the resonant frequency, which keeps uh, deviating over time. So that is a concept in these graphs. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Mala, I just have a one, uh, one small question. I'm curious, you showed the change of the frequency, and I showed the change of the amplitude. Have you looked at uh, the change of the resonant peak width? Uh, that is the Q factor. You build up the MAMS resonance structures and the coupled one, which is novel very good. And you showed the change of the frequency or change of the amplitude due to your mass density on it, yeah, the particle density on it. Yeah. Whether there is a change of the resonance peak width as well. So by resonant peak width, uh, are you asking about the bandwidth? The, let's see the half width maximum or in the log term, what's the, the width change? Yeah, for this one, uh, I didn't uh, exactly calculate what was the change, but uh, the initial Q factor was about uh, uh, 3000. 
mm-hmm. during this 5.5 megahertz okay. and uh, this 3 dB bandwidth. So initially it was coming around close to 3000. I didn't uh, exactly calculate after depositing particles onto these resonators. I see. I see. So the Q factor changes uh, uh, could be another indicator. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if no further questions, let's thank Mala again. Thank you very much, Mala. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and uh, now I think this is the end of this session. We are fortunately had uh, three very different, uh, but uh, very excellent uh, talks and uh, showing promising works. I hope they can continue and uh, I wish them all the success with their postgraduate study. And I would like also thank you for taking part in this session. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. I think uh, just for the purpose of the Edwards, I think the Kappa Award will open again later in the year with a closing date on the 17th of November this year. So if anybody interested, you're welcome to apply. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.